Well, good morning, church. Oh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord with you. And I mean that. It really is. This is a, this is a holy space. This is a sacred space. Friends online, it is good to be with you in your, in your sacred space. And man, I'm happy to be here. Um, if I haven't met you, my name is Jaden. And typically, you will find me here in the wee hours of the night on Mondays because I have the really, really distinct joy of getting to lead our young adults ministry here. And it is, yeah, they're, they're repping. Um, it is, oh man, it's, it's special. And I don't know when the last time you rubbed shoulders with uh, a young person in your life, a young adult, but can I just tell you, because I get a distinct front row seat to it every week, that God is doing something special in this generation. God is, God is doing a mighty work and it is, yeah. And it's not, just, it's not just a bunch of people that are showing up and having an awesome praise party, but they have this dependency on the Lord with their whole life and their whole future that, that it just is awestrucking to, to, to look at the ways that, that they are saying, uh, no, that this faith is mine, that, that a relationship with Jesus is mine and I'm not stepping into this realm and, and scary world of adulthood without him. And I'm gonna let him take the reins for whatever comes next. And ah, man, I just love him. I love you guys. And oh, it is fun to get to open the God's word with them often, but it's really, really fun to get to open God's word with you. Um, another fun fact about me, I love Ben Rector. And if anyone, if anyone likes Ben Rector, just like a good, clean, wholesome dude, good, clean, wholesome music. Hard to find these days, truly. Um, but I really, I love Ben Rector, have for a long time. And when I was a freshman in college, I was your quintessential, like overly zealous uh, college freshman. I was just like, woo, let's commit to everything. And I, by my, by my second semester, I had petitioned to, to take extra classes, like you actually have to fill out forms in order to ask to take more, just so, get this, just so that I could take an intermediate guitar class and I had never picked a guitar up. Like there was no reason for it. I didn't need a guitar class, but I was like, yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask to be able to take more classes so that I can learn how to play the guitar. Dumb, honestly. I still can't play the guitar in case you're wondering. But I was in, I was in way too many units. I was totally like, head first trying to dive into the community of my, my brand new college. And then I was also, I had just started working here. So I was driving back to my hometown to, to work in kids ministry here at the church. And I was also on the side, I was, I was serving in our junior high ministry. So I was leading a, a group of seventh grade girls, which, yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, you, but you get it. And, and so I was just, by the time I was about halfway through the semester, I was one of those like, was this a good idea? Probably not. Will I do it differently next semester? Yeah, but I can't, I can't quit now. And so they had announced that, um, they announced the headliner of our spring fling, which they put um, on the, the night before finals week, which is the very end of dead week, accurately named. And so they do it so that you can, at the very end of just like, I think I'm gonna die. At the very end, they're like, hey, we're gonna give you something that's gonna give you the gusto that you need to make it through finals. And so they were like, guess what? Ben Rector is gonna be at Spring Fling. And I was like, this is the best news ever. And it instantly became that thing that I was just using like as, as like a carrot in front of my face. Like, don't worry, Ben Rector's coming. You can make it through this semester. And so oh, I was just so excited. Everyone knew, because I was like, God, you're never gonna believe who's coming to, the, coming to my school. And it was just this, this really big deal. I'd made it a big deal. And then, the, and then the Thursday of Dead Week, um, my roommate had a, had a relational crisis in her family, and so her family started to fall apart. And, and I had to kind of just like sh shelf what I was doing in terms of studying so that I could just be with her. And I was like, it's okay, Jane, don't remember, like Ben Rector's in the morning, like you, or Ben Rector's tomorrow, you got this. And so I like put all my studying aside. I woke up extra early the next morning to get the studying in. And then I went and I took, I, I like did the, the last classwork before the weekend was here. And I got home and I told my roommate, like, I'm just gonna take a quick, quick power nap before Ben Rector tonight. And if you're already gasping, you know where this is going. I slept through the whole concert. Yeah, I woke up like five hours later and I was devastated. And not only was I just devastated, everyone knew how excited I was. So I had them to tell this story over and over and relive how mad at myself I was and how just mad, like I was just mad. I woke up just angry. I was like, Jaden, how'd you do that? Have you ever been in a position like that? 
Maybe for you, it's a lot less about a concert and more like you wake up from a decade of your life and you're like, did I just miss everything? Where, where did my 20s go? Where did, where, did my, where did my 40s disappear to? And, and we, we start to find ourselves in this perpetual perpetual cycle of just, I work and I'm exhausted, but it's okay because I'm gonna have a break pretty soon, probably, and then I work and then I work. And we find ourselves not just in these cycles, it actually just starts to become who we are. We're perpetually exhausted. We're perpetually overwhelmed. And we're perpetually caring way too much than we know what to do with. But, but we just think something's coming. And then really by the time that thing that we've deemed to be the break from the thing is now the thing that has added a bunch more weight. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, when's the break coming? Is this what like your 70s are for maybe? If you're in your 70s, please tell me because I'm really hoping so. But we, we, start to, we start to fall into this pattern where we're working right through God's rhythms of rest and we start sleeping right through the rewards he has for us every day. And we wake up one day and we're like, I, th- I think I missed it. I-, I think I missed it. And I don't know about you, but I feel this way. And so I'm assuming you probably do too. I don't, I don't wanna miss what God has for me. I don't. And I know too often I wake up and I feel like I've missed it and I don't wanna miss it because if God is alive and active and he's got a plan and a purpose for my life, I don't wanna sleep through it. And I'm so worried that I'm gonna be so overwhelmed all the time that I'm gonna wake up one day and realize I missed the glory of just being with the Lord. And so as I was sitting with the Lord and I was praying, okay, God, it's Labor Day weekend. Like, what would you desire for your church to study? Like, what would you desire for for us to wrestle with in your word? On this specific morning, I felt like you brought me back to a passage that has just been so critical in my life for over a year now that I've just really, really sat before him with. Like, please, God, I want you to illuminate this for me in a way that I've just never understood it before. Because the truth is, it's probably a passage you've heard. It's, It's probably odds are one you've read. Maybe even you have memorized. But my hope and my prayer is that it would come alive again for you and it would be very specific for this season of life that God has you in. And so if you have a Bible, if you wanna turn with with me, we're gonna camp out in Matthew 11 this morning. Matthew 11, verse 28, it starts like this. These These are in red. If you have a Bible that has some letters in red, that means it's the words of Jesus. So what we're reading here is the, it's Jesus speaking in the Bible. And it says, starts this way. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are, that you listen, that you hear us when we pray. God, thank you that we can be certain that when we when we come before you, we don't have to wonder who it is that meets us on the other side. We, you have revealed to us who you are time and time again, page after page and moment after moment being with you that we can be confident in who you are. And God, right now, as we just read the words weary and burdened, I know there's things that are already bubbling to the surface in each and every one of us because we're human And so whatever it is, God, I just pray that you would allow us and invite us and that we would feel the invitation to bring it to you, that we can bring it right now to you. And that actually from a position of holding that is where you want to meet us, not once we've set it aside, but with it in tow. God, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, we glorify you, and it's in your name we pray, amen. So just before this verse, just before this verse in Matthew, Jesus has just made a very, very huge claim. He is speaking to the Pharisees, which would have been the religious leaders at the time. And he's speaking to the Jewish people that the religious leaders are talking to. So Jesus is in a, in a handful of people who know the law well. In fact, they know the law so well, scripture tells us that these Pharisees are actually trying to throw on more man-made laws on top of the law that they're already trying to fight and wrestle with to get to God. And so he, he, he comes to them in this moment and he makes the claim and says, hey, no one knows the father except the son. No, no one, knows. he's saying my relationship with the father is so intimate, so all-knowing that no one can reveal the heart of the father like I can, no one can. Everyone who's trying to tell you what it is, no no one can reveal to you the Father 
except me, the son. It's the same, the same part of scripture in, in John 14 when we read, no one can come to the father except through him, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. He's saying, hey, this, this law that you have tied yourself up in, trying so hard to earn and grit your way through trying to deserve the right to be in a relationship with Jesus, it's not the way. It's not gonna be the way. And then when we read in Matthew 23 that these Pharisees are actually throwing on more man-made regulations and laws on top of them that they aren't even willing to lift a finger of, that's what scripture says. Pharisees won't even, won't even do them themselves, but they're like, hey, not only do you have to follow all of, all of God's law in the Old Testament, there's also all these extra things in order to get to him, for him to even pay attention to you. And they're starting to twist this into something that they have to earn and work, and they're perpetually exhausted from trying to please God trying to earn the right for God to maybe pay attention to them for a moment. And this is where Jesus meets them. He meets them here and he says, hey, hey, no one knows the father except the son. No one knows the father except the son. And they're, they're fighting for approval. They're moving so fast. They're working so hard. And what does, Jesus, what does Jesus meet them with? He meets them with an invitation, a really gentle invitation. Church, this fall, you're going to have a million things to do. A million. We are already running down Candy Cane Lane. Like, let's be honest. We are, we're, we're all, it's practically Christmas. <laughs> you're gonna have a million things to do. And odds are, they're probably really good commitments. Your family, maybe it's school, your, your job. Maybe it's, I hope, maybe it's church. You're gonna have commitment on top of commitment. But here's the thing about this passage. The more I sat with it, I realized this passage is not about busyness, though I've deemed it as one for so long. It's not about busyness. A really good, honest, like sweep of your calendar can handle that kind of stuff. But this passage is about the condition of our soul. Saying that what, whatever it is that you, whatever space and place and people God brings in front of you, what you have to offer them is the condition of your soul one that is either met with Jesus or one that is perpetually exhausted. That's what you're carrying into spaces. And so that's what Jesus desires to address here. And so if Jesus desires to address it, I think it's important that we pay attention to what he has to say. So he says, hey, right here, weary and burdened, the first invitation is come to me. He says, come, come to me. It's this sweet invitation amidst some really, really burdened, weary people, humans like us. I remember about a year ago, I was in a position, one I'm sure probably half of this room is in right now. I was just, I was tired. I was exhausted. It felt like things in my life were falling apart that I didn't do to deserve or earn, but for some reason they were crumbling. And I just one day felt like I was going crazy. Like I did, what did I do to deserve the fact for, to deserve the right for all of these things to fall apart? And I didn't do it. Have you ever felt that way? And you're like, I didn't do this. But, I, but I'm standing in the middle of a mess. And so I remember I picked up the phone and I called my, my, my friend, the like safe friend that I know I can just like fall apart to. You know those people? And I just kind of like blubbered all the things that were going on, like snot dripping down my phone. And I just, I mean, I just laid it all out there. And I just talked and talked and talked and then, I took a deep breath, like waiting for her to respond. And instead of what I thought she was gonna tell me, she just said, hey, Jay, you wanna come over? And I just kind of was quiet. And she's like, all right, I'll see you in a few minutes. Love you, and hung up. And I drove myself down there, and I walked in the house, and I could see on her kitchen counter that she had just finished making dinner. The, the table was set for a dinner with her family. I could hear the fact that she had just sent her kids upstairs and I, there was a little bowl of food waiting for me on the, on the side table next to the couch. And there was an anthropology candle lit. And it was, it was just like, she made the decision right there that everything else wasn't worth it. Sitting with me in the middle of my mess was the most important thing on her agenda. And when I read this, that's how I picture the heart of God. Tenfold. That there is nothing else more important than all of your weary and all of your burden to just bring it to me and I will have a spread waiting for you of who I am. All that you could be offered. Just come, come to me in that. Because honestly, when I called her, I expected and I actually was looking for a solution. 
if I'm, if I'm honest. I, I wanted her to tell me how I could fix this. And I expected her to maybe give me like an instruction manual. And then I think in like my, my deep guilt, knowing that I'm just, I'm a sinner, I was like, I probably did something to deserve this. So just tell me what it is so I can fix it. And I expected her to just be like, you remember that one time? Yeah, you need to go say sorry. Remember? And I just, I was so ready to kind of lay it all out there for her and for her to just tell me, here's why you, you deserve the right to feel this way. Or here's what you did to deserve feeling this way. But do you notice that in this passage, neither one of those is the Jesus that meets us? He doesn't meet us with instruction and he doesn't meet us with shame. He's a, he's a God of, of grace that meets us with rest and a rest for our souls. It's not this kind of physical rest, though, though it can equate sometimes to physical rest, but it's a, it's a rest for our souls. And he says, hey, you know that thing in the back of your head that you carry with you into every space you go into? You know that mistake you made that you feel pigeonholed by that no one can forget and it's now just who I, what, what they identify you as? You know that, that anxiety that just like looms in the back of your mind 24 seven and you don't even know where it came from? Bring all of that to me and what I wanna give you is rest, not a reason why you deserve the right to feel that way or what you did to earn the right to feel that way, but I wanna give you rest right there, right in the middle of it. That, that's the Jesus that we see meeting us here when we get to see his heart and his character on display. And then we see the second invitation. See, he says, he says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. Now yoke, if, you, if, if you're like, what is this? Don't worry, me too. I, I thought it was about eggs for a really long time, but it's not about eggs. Yokes are something that the Jewish people would have had really great reference for. They, they knew what a yoke was because a yoke is something that is used in plowing fields. It would connect two oxen and it would allow them to, to shoulder the load together to be able to plow the field so that when one got tired, they could kind of drop their shoulder a little bit and then the other one could kind of carry some of the heavy lifting and then they could get tired and they could, and they were, they were yoked together. This was the language. They were yoked together so that they could share the burden of having to plow through a field. And so these Jewish people, they actually use this term a lot to describe they, the way that they felt being in obedience to the law. They felt yoked to it. They felt, felt like it was this burden that they had carried upon their shoulders. And so Jesus uses the language that, that they feel connects them to what they're trying to earn and deserve. And he actually uses it and he says, hey, yoke yourself to me. He says, take my yoke upon you. It's light, it's easy, it's well-fitting. This language, it's actually the, the same language that we see when, when, it, when scripture begins to describe what it means to be so connected to Jesus that we become a disciple. That when we are, when we are so, when we, we, when we say, God, you are the Lord and the leader of my life. I will walk following you. That, that's what this means. He's saying, hey, take my yoke of discipleship upon your shoulders. Become so deeply connected to me that those burdens that are in front of you, when I plow through them, I carry the heavy lifting and you just hold on and watch what I will do as I plow the field in front of you. He's not saying that they disappear. He's saying, hey, I wanna plow through them for you. Yoke yourself to me. Let me carry the weight of this. That, that following Jesus, becoming his beloved child, it means the old is gone and the new has come and he desires to carry the weight, not just with you, but for you that he will take the, the heavy lifting. If you're like, yoke still don't make sense. Have you ever been in a group project? It's like, it's like someone is saying, hey, I'm gonna do the whole group project and you will get to stand at the front of the classroom and, and you get to put your name on it. Like, th that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm gonna plow the field. You get to just be yoked to me. You get to just be I identified with me in the process. John, first John 5, 3 says, in fact, this is for the love, this is how we love God, that we keep his commands. And they describe his commands to not be burdensome. He's saying, hey, there is indeed a way in which we love God that involves being obediently connected to him. But let me tell you, it's not burdensome. In fact, it is tailor-made for your life. The people, the plans, the purpose, they're tailor-made for what it is that I desire for you to do this side of eternity. I remember really, really vividly 
the day after I graduated high school sitting on my childhood bed. And I had just graduated the night before and so I was flipping through all the pictures that I had taken with my family and with my friends. And by picture seven, I was weeping, sitting there just weeping. Because in this picture, you could see a girl who, who had everything that a, a high school record could have achieved. I had all the pins, the sashes, the medals, the accolades, I, I had it. I played soccer, I, I had the friends. I, I did all the things you needed to do to feel on top of the world on graduation day. I made sure of it. But the problem was, is when I looked at that picture, all I could see were the eyes of a girl who was exhausted and so lonely. So lonely. Because none of it, none of it was, was actually giving me what I was looking for. And I was so fixated on making sure other people felt safe and loved and cared for and oh, don't, don't burden them with anything going on in your life. They're, not gonna, they're just gonna exploit you for it. It's not gonna work. Don't trust them. Just put on a good show. Achieve everything you can. And by the end of it, you'll just you know, you'll be at the mountaintop. It's gonna be great. But you know what? It wasn't. And I bet if I asked you to throw up a picture of yourself, what I see and what you see are probably two different people because you know what's really behind your eyeballs too. You know what it really feels like to be yoked to something other than Jesus like I was, to expectations, to pleasing people, to putting on a show that made it look like my life was picture perfect that there was no mistake, that I had no heaviness, that you didn't need to worry about me, I'm good, I, I got you, I can carry more. I... And truthfully, I had 17 yokes on my shoulders pulling me in different directions and I was exhausted, I was lonely, and I was so unfulfilled. I don't know what the Lord's stirring up in your heart when you think of looking at a picture of yourself. Maybe try this, close your eyes. What's heavy? What burdens you? And when I say yoke on your shoulders, you're like, oh, you have no idea this thing I carry. Now take it to Jesus. What do his eyes say to you? Because can I tell you what his word says? It says that when you approach God's throne of grace, that's who you can expect to be on the throne, a God of grace, that you can confidently expect a God of grace to meet you in whatever mess it is attached to your shoulders. Meet him there. Okay, you can jump back with me. So Jesus is saying, come to me with it in tow, whatever it is that he's stirring up in you. He's saying, hey, bring that into my presence. And then he's saying, take my yoke upon you. Take something else on your shoulders. And you know what? It's not heavy and it's not gonna burden you. It's actually easy and it's light. You don't need to add it on top of the other ones. Those ones you get to lay at my feet. This one you pick up and you put on. One, one yoke. And that is to be identified as a disciple of Jesus. That is the only yoke you need to carry. All things fall short of being yoked to the God of the universe. And then there's this third invitation here that we see. He says, come, he says, take, and he says, learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart. He says, learn from me. This is the language that invites our active discipleship. It's the same Greek root word that we get the word disciple from. It's the same word as learn. That the discipleship is actively walking with the Lord daily. That when he splits himself open here, that when God himself tells you about his heart, you know what words he used to describe it? Gentle and humble. That that is your savior. That is your God. Gentle and humble is the most true thing about him when he splits his heart open for you. And so he, in, he invites us into a commitment with him. One that is a daily, daily 
decision and commitment to walk with Jesus. But remember, it's not commitments like you probably think about earthly commitments. It's not heavy and it doesn't make you wanna cry when you go to sleep. In fact, his commitment is, is well-fitting. It's well-tailored to your life and it's one that meets you with joy and hope and peace and patience. That's his tailor-made walk for you and it's with him in the process. Sometimes when I read this passage, and I, I think I did for far too long, I felt like this passage was about busyness. And so I thought, okay, what I, what I really need to do is just take all the things that are going on in my life. I need to goodwill, drop them off at the goodwill drop-off bin. At, that is Jesus's feet. He's gonna hand me a receipt that's like a, a good solid two-hour nap. I'm gonna walk away. I'm gonna feel a lot better afterwards. That's how I used to always read this passage. But I feel like the more I read it, the more I realized this passage has nothing to do with taking a nap. It's really about active invitational verbs. Come, take, and learn. It's a, it's a process. It's a relinquishment. It's a picking up, and it's a walking with actively daily. Like the invitation we see from Luke in Luke 9 when he says, he's talking to the disciples. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will, will save it. See, what, you, what he's saying, the, the thing you're looking for, the rest you need, the, the care for your soul you need, it's not found in money, it's not found in people, it's not found in anything this world has to offer. What it's found is in the daily obedient decision to walk with me, to rest with me, to be with me, to lock eyes with me and to trust me. Dallas Willard describes a disciple this way. He says, a disciple is a person who's decided that the most important thing in their life is to learn how to do what Jesus said to do. So simple, I love it. That the most important thing in life is to learn how to do what Jesus invited you to do. It's the most important thing we get to do. That discipleship, this walking with Jesus, it's where our life is found. It's where our purpose is found. It's where our freedom is found. And it's available to us daily. And, and I feel like it's also important to say that this isn't just some freedom from work. This isn't just some like, ah, oh, I'm gonna open my hands and I'm gonna give everything to Jesus. And you know what he's gonna meet me with? Like financial freedom, retiring at 30, vacation 24-7, Everyone's gonna be perfect and I'm gonna have the best friendships and relationships, sand in my toes all the time. Like when, when he says, come to me, that's not on the other side of what we meet him with. It doesn't say it. He says, you know what you're gonna get? You're gonna get a rest from your soul and an invitation to walk with me. Why? Because his yoke is still a yoke. It's still a commitment and it comes with work, but it comes with work from a holy God it comes with invitations, trust, and obedience that is with a holy God that takes on the responsibility of it. And we get to just kind of like trot behind in the wake of all the things that he's doing and marvel at them. Can you imagine? He's like, hey, just trust me. Watch what I will do. Stay connected to me and watch what I will do. Eugene Peterson's message version of it says, he articulates the passage this way, it's beautiful. He says, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. See, this passage is about this countercultural intertwining of our work and our rest saying that, that one is not void of the others, but in fact, when Jesus is a part of all of them, all of a the sudden, there are reward. When Jesus is, is dictating and involved in our work, and when Jesus is the Lord and the leader of our rest, all of a sudden, all of it's the prize because all of it is his relationship with Jesus. That, that these unforced rhythms of grace, that when his agenda becomes our own agenda, all of a sudden, it becomes our purpose. It's not just one more task. That when his commission starts to fuel your work, it now becomes delightful, not burdensome. That when that our rest isn't just sitting exhausted, hoping to take a nap, but the rest is actually the thing that starts to fuel our trust that he will care for tomorrow. And that our reward, it's not just a break from it all, 
but our reward actually is the love and the intimate relationship that we get with Jesus every day, not just the day we get a little bit of seizing from it. That's the reward. See, the, the walk with him and the work with him, they're still there. They're still there. It's, it's not void of that, but it's involved. It's intertwined into it. That's where the rest from our soul is found. He says, take, learn my way, let me lead you. In fact, drop your shoulder and I'm gonna carry the wins and the losses, the guilt and the shame. I'm gonna carry everything that you actually deserve. I will carry it. I'm gonna plow through these fields and you get to just be attached to me. You don't have to, you don't have to do the work. And in fact, when you do the work and it doesn't go well, I actually take the credit and the failure of it. He, he, takes, he takes all authority of it and you just get to, you get, you get to play around in the playground of failing and successing, su- succeeding and you're like, I don't know where I am, but don't worry, God's got me. I'm gonna try again tomorrow, knowing that the mercy's new again. I'm gonna try again tomorrow to walk out what it means to be yoked and connected to Jesus. That, that when we read that his yoke is easy, it's not this like American dream. It's not. And I know because I want it to. And I wasn't just exhausted then, then I'm exhausted now. And if I'm honest with you, that, that is what I want. I want the picture perfect family. And I, and I don't wanna feel like I'm trying to please everyone all the time. And I don't wanna feel like I've got a million expectations of people around me on my shoulders. But the truth is, daily I have to decide which one's gonna drive my life. Because they're there. And I need to come to Jesus. I need to lock eyes with him and know that the gifter of grace is who I find, not a gifter of of more to do, not a gifter of shame and try again. It's not the Jesus that I meet and it's not the Jesus you meet. It's a gifter of grace. We're not yoked to some vacation and bliss. We're yoked to a God who can do the impossible. We're yoked to a God who what we deserve was absolute death, separation from God. And yet he said, "Uh uh-uh. Uh Uh-uh, I love them too much. I'm gonna send my son. I'm gonna make him die upon a cross carrying every sin and weight that you and I, that we deserve. And he carried all of it to the cross and he died in order to reconcile this possible relationship with you. He said, I'm gonna go to the very full extent and I'm gonna die a death that I didn't deserve because I lived life perfectly and I lived it without sin, yet I'm gonna still take your weight upon my shoulders, die on a cross so that you get to rest in a God who offers grace, who offers rest and who offers freedom, who offers a a soul that can be light, who offers a, a life that can be purposeful and most importantly, who offers the ability to be tethered to the God of the universe. And then not only does he give you a mission, not only does he give you a relationship with him, and he's like, you're good to go, see you later. No, 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 he actually walks with you. And then you can know, because of what his word says, you can know who to expect on the other side. It is a God of humility a God of grace, a God of hope, a God of peace, a God of faithfulness and goodness that he doesn't just save you and abandon you and say, you're welcome, you got this, have fun this side of eternity, see you later. He actually walks with you in the process. He doesn't just clean you up and be like, all right, now fumble your way until I meet you face to face. He's like, no, 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 I wanna be with you every day, every moment to supply all that you need until I get to see you face to face and we get to just bask in the glory together. And then not only Does he save you? Not only does he gift you the opportunity to be present with him always, he actually gives you purpose. Though none of us deserve the right to partake in the work of a holy and glorious God, he doesn't need us, but he he invites us to be a part of it. Do you know what a gift that is? That, That we actually get to be a part of telling the greatest story of all time? that we actually get to be a part of watching what happens when someone comes to know Jesus for the very first time and the lights come on in their eyeballs, (laughs) that we get to be a vessel that gets to be used for this world to know peace and love and joy, that we get to be a part of it, that not only are we saved, not only do we get a relationship with him, all of that could have been good enough, but he actually gives us an opportunity to, to be in it with him 
And that while he could take every win, he's like, hey, you have no idea. Come, come, come feel the dust of my sandals. Watch my work. You're gonna be amazed. You're gonna be amazed. He lets us have a part in it. Not because we did anything to deserve it, but because he cares about us enough that he knows there's no, there's no greater joy than getting to see someone come to know Jesus. There's no greater joy than getting to play whatever part he gifts us in this local church. There's no greater part than the part we get to play in being an instrument used by the Lord this side of eternity. There's no greater, there's no greater job on earth. And it's not just a job, it's who we become in the process. When we walk into those spaces and those places, it's the discipleship that we carry that no matter what your job, whatever, whatever your family looks like, no matter what it is, you have a mission. It's called the co-mission and that is to go therefore and make disciples and that he allows you to be a part of it. Oh, it's a gift. Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, has this beautiful, beautiful quote. And he says, only as we walk ever deeper into his tender kindness can we live the Christian life as the New Testament calls us to. Only as we drink down the kindness of the heart of Christ will we ever leave in our wake, everywhere we go the aroma of heaven and die one day having startled the world with glimpses of a divine kindness too great to be boxed in by what we deserve. What I didn't tell you about the concert was that it was free. And not only was it free, I was living on campus at the time, and so it actually was about three feet outside my dorm bedroom window on the lawn. And, best part, and oh, it's so embarrassing to say out loud, you know what woke me up? The crashing of the drums of the final note of the concert. So not only did I have to miss it, I had to sit there while everyone cheered on the final note of the concert that I just missed, that I told everyone about, because I was so stoked. I want my life to have an aroma of heaven. I don't wanna miss it. I don't wanna miss the chance for God to do a transformative work in me but ultimately I don't wanna miss the chance to sit at the feet of my savior, being too busy, preoccupied, or too burdened to feel like he could really care about me in that moment. Because the truth is, it's, he's actually closer to you than the inches of the concert and the, and the seconds of the downbeat. He's closer than your very breath. You don't need to miss him. You get to say, hey, right here, these burdens, this heaviness, I actually just have to drop it because he's right here. I don't have to take it anywhere. It's the God of grace, the God of goodness, and the God of a divine love is waiting for you. You don't have to miss it. You don't have to work your way for it or to deserve it. Don't sleep through the opportunity because the reward is a relationship with Jesus. He says, you, to my wounded, weary, burdened child, come to me, lock eyes with me, see you the way I see you, not the way the world's trying to tell you. Take my yoke, it's greater than any other, and learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn what it means to walk with me. There's no greater joy. Love your humble and gentle savior. You're more loved than you could ever know. And you don't deserve it and you have no business trying to earn it. And yet he made a way for you and for me. That's our God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, as I read this passage, I just can't help but but feel all of the things in my life that feel so heavy bubble to the surface. And yet I know nothing is greater or impossible than what you can handle. And God, I pray now as, as, as us, your church, a piece of the kingdom of God, that you would give us those tangible reminders that you are with us 
that as we begin to, to wrestle through the commitments on top of commitments that are probably really good and that are probably have good intentions behind them, that you would remind us that none of that defines us except being yours. And God, I just pray now that we would be a church that is marked by the way in which we are so tethered to you. Nothing more, nothing less. But we are marked as humans by our dependency on the one who made a way when there was no way. God, now as we head into a time of worship and we, and we glorify you, God, I pray that we would lay our burdens actually at your feet and that we would look to you, the maker of heaven and earth, and, and let you hold us in the process. We love you, we praise you, and it's in your name we will forever pray, amen.